our first speaker today is Gautam Anand from Bengal Engineering and Science University, University. from India. Uh, Gautam, thank you. Thank you. First of all, good morning on not so sunny day of Cambridge. And uh, I am Gautam Anand. I am doing my master's at uh, Bengal Engineering and Science University, Shippur. Uh, along with me, P. Day and P. P. Chattopadhyay are from Bengal Engineering and Science University. P. J. J. Koch is from Tata Steel, Europe. And D. Chakravarti is from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. I would like to acknowledge Ministry of Steel, Government of India, under which I started doing my steel research. Indian Institute of Metal for providing me partial travel grants. That's why I'm here. So uh, the uh, topic of my talk is architecture and microstructure in steel. Uh, my research in this area started from my seemingly naive question that what is the best microstructure? Simple question with uh, many possible answers. So when we talk about deterministic structure property correlation, so we need to define the microstructure. What are the various constituents in the microstructure? What is the shape and size of the microstructure? Uh, what is the morphology of the constituent of the microstructure? For most of the cases, there are empirical correlations. But I am more interested in uh, morphological variations and topological uh, uh, characteristic of the microstructure. That's why it's architectured microstructure. Now, architecture and microstructure, how they are correlated? That's the first question. People say a lot, architecture, whatever. So architecture, one of the key example of architecture in my view is uh, this masonry arc. Roman did that 2,000 years ago. And it's a rare engineering feat. It seems very simple. But uh, a specialty of this arc is you have these stones they put in one by one manner. And the last stone, which is very important, is called keystone. It takes the least load. But the moment they put the keystone, this structure transforms into a pure compressive form. And strange thing is that if someone looks like that, OK, yeah, it's, it's stable. But there are two type of loads here. First is gravitational inline load and radial inward load. But force are resolved in such a manner that it all load is transformed into compressive form. So in this architectural structural design, structure is so designed that all load is transformed into compressive load. So this is one, one, one fact. And what about the microstructure? We all know that there are three, chemistry, energy, and time. Everyone knows that. They are important uh, parameters for the genesis of the microstructure. But if we, uh, in our view, phase uh, defect structure and uh, 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 orientation, these are the three key parameters which need to be tuned for architecturing in microstructure as such. Rather, if we, we deal with the all six, mic uh, six parameters, we, we may end up with a uh, architecture microstructure where we are uh, decreasing the uh, uh, development of uh, tensile uh, stress during the loading. So in both of these cases, integration is very important, how the microstructure is integrated. We think microstructure not in the term of evolutionary point of view, but we would like to think it in the term of constructional point of view. So in this part, uh, now we are talking about architecture. So we should have a parameter. We have defined a parameter called order of architecture. In this case, we are talking about length scale of representative volume element divided by length scale of architecture. And we, it's a semi-quantitative plot, because since I still need to plot this graph, most uh, lowest level of uh, order of architecture is in the core shell structures. The mo most simple example is in the case of iron, chromium, magnesium, aluminum, nickel alloy, possibly. There is a precipitate where copper is in the core, while uh, nickel, manganese, aluminum shell is present. And it's very interesting to see if the composition is changed, the property changes enormously. So in that case, my representative volume element is the precipitate and the region surrounded by it, which is influenced by that. So in that case, the both rise, uh, lies in nanometer range, so order of architecture is 1, in my view. Second part is architecturing in microstructure. Here, architecturing is done on the grain, few grain scale, while the representative volume element may be, may, may, may be having 100 grains. So we are having length scale of RVEE is a uh, few hundred micron, while uh, this uh, microstructure may be in the range of tens of microns. So 10, 100 divided by 10, 2, or uh, uh, 
10 to the power 2. So the order of architecture is 2. Now, I'm quite interested about this functional composite part. Function, uh, uh, we have written, rather I want to call it functional systems, because uh, we, uh, the typical example is a sandwich structure in aerospace application. There is a skin, there is a core, there is again skin, and there are lots of layers. The core architecturing lies in the core structure where they have honeycomb structure or whatever structure it may be. It depends on what is the functionality of the structure. And last is the superstructure. Eiffel Tower is an example, as simple as that. So, it's not working. Oh, sorry. So, uh, my work was inspired by this experimental work what uh, our group did back in uh, Besu. So, here, what, what, uh, what happens in a DP steel? Uh, in DP steel, you have uh, uh, you can increase martensite content and you can increase the strength or uh, other properties, but there is a limit up till you can increase that, and uh, that's a serious limitation. If you want to increase the strength, why should we be limited only by the volume fraction? So this is a very innovative work in which the initial structure is was varied that lead to the f variation in the final structure. In this case, it was initial structure was the martensite that lead to this fibrous structure. In this case, initial structure was perlite that lead to the island type of martensite structure. In this case, it was austenite that lead to be blocky and banded structure of martensite. But important thing is, ki each case it was intercritically annealed at same temperature for same time to have an equal volume fraction of martensite, and that led to uh, variation in the property of uh, near about 100 MPa, substantial in my view, and. Uh, Another important observation from this work was uh, uh, we observed the subsurface of the tensile broken sample. And uh, in the case of this sample, uh, primarily the uh, rupture started at the martensite martensite interface, while in these two cases it started at the ferrite martensite interface. So, this is one observation which we would use later. And now, what w from there, what was my objective? I wanted to architecture a deep steel through micromechanical modeling. So I had the distinct three tasks for this particular uh, work. First is microstructure generation, second is micromechanical analysis, and third is optimization. Now, how can I generate a microstructure? There are various methods. Monte Carlo is there, cello automata is there. But we chose this very interesting technique called Voronoi tessellation. And I did micromechanical analysis by elastoplastic finite element method, simple. Optimization I hope to do by the genetic algorithm. Okay, so what's Voronoi tessellation? It's a very interesting technique. It's, it, it's highly interdisciplinary and has been used in wide areas of science. How it happens? First, we have a random seeds. These random seeds, they can be generated randomly. In the later part, we join the nearest neighbor points and form a triangle by a technique called Delaunay triangulation. It's a simple technique. And after that, we draw a circumcircle out of this triangle and calculate what is the center of that triangle. And when we got these centers, we join them. And those form a cell. And interesting thing is that these cells uh, uh, follow a Poisson's distribution, so which, which we usually observe in EQX grain structure. But it, this technique is very good for EQX structure. But what about the deep steel structure, which is, which is seemingly complex in comparison to this? So, in Tata Steel with PJJ Koch, he has worked some, did some work in this part where they have developed the multi-level Voronoi structure. In this case, uh, uh, highly complex structure can be generated. Uh, the basic algorithm is, first there is a fine level tessellation. By the fine level tessellation, they get these martensite particles. After that, the, uh, the, the algorithm is seen what I have described earlier. And in the second level, they descri describe this master level tessellation which is shown in green. And now, the green would superimpose this fine one. So whatever lies inside, that would go into, that, that would be consi now considered as a ferrite. But whatever martensite are at the interface, now they are considered, they are filtered off and they are considered, okay, these martensite particles would be there. So, after that, we, we started to do some uh, finite element analysis in ANSYS. And uh, in this case, you know, what we have seen, we have uh, defined a contiguity parameter. It's not over, defined over here. Contiguity parameter can be simply calculated if we draw a straight line. 
if we draw a straight line, then how many intersection of ferrite ferrite interface would come, how many intersection of ferrite martensite intersection would come, and how many intersection uh, of uh, ferrite martensite interface would be there. And as it is quite visible in von Mises stress distribution, that a high stress distribution was present in the case of uh, martensite martensite interface usually, and a high stress distribution is at the ferrite uh, martensite interface. And when we, we post-processed the data to see what was the strain distribution as such in the structure. And what we saw here, that most, in the most of the cases, there is average strain exists on the most of the nodes. Now, ferrite contiguity parameter, further in, we increase the parameter and see uh, how the structure developed. And it was a partially banded and partially island type of structure. In this case, the, uh, again, uh, there is, there is a, uh, increase in, uh, there is a hot spot of stress at the ferrite, ferrite or ferrite, sorry, martensite ferrite interface, while high strain was present in the case not exactly uh, at the ferrite martensite interface, rather a bit away f from the interface. Further increase in the uh, contiguity parameter yield that, as we can clearly see, there is a greater density of uh, stress hotspot in the structure, while similarly the strain hotspots hot are there, but uh, one important uh, uh, thing which we need to see here is that when the stress hotspot arises, which may possibly lead to uh, the, uh, which may possibly lead to uh, rupture of martensite martensite interf interface, and we have a high strain density, this 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 is seemingly quite dangerous situation because that would easily lead to uh, failure in most of the cases. After that, further increase the uh, uh, ferrite contiguity parameter, and we are, we are clearly seeing some linking up of uh, some linking of, of uh, uh, this uh, uh, stress hotspot. But such uh, and a similar similar linking we are seeing in the case of strain hotspot and uniform distribution of strain in most of the nodes. We keep on increasing that, and uh, we are seeing here is that uh, th now, now the, you see there is a clear link up between the uh, stress stress hotspot, while strain. Uh, but but even in this situation, we are not seeing any linking between uh, strain hotspots, and the the most of the strain is concentrated on uh, this lower part of the uh, uh, in most of the node. Lower strain concentration is present. Now this is a banded structure. The, it is entirely different what we are considering earlier, which are uh, usually a random structure. In this case, we are seeing that most of the strain is in the banded part, while sorry, yeah, most of the stress hotspots are in the banded part, while the strain lies in between these martensite uh, islands. But impo it's important to see here is that uh, most of the strain in the nodes is, uh, is, is having average value. Now, this is this is a general observation, and uh, we have uh, it's not included over here. But we have uh, we, we we do found one relation between uh, ferrite contiguity parameter and martensite contiguity parameter with the stress and strain hotspot. But there is a problem. This ANSYS data cannot be used for optimization in genetic algorithm. So we need to write our own code uh, for that. And uh, here we have used a six-node. Isostrain uh, linear linear strain triangle, uh, uh, and uh, what we are doing here is that we are loading the microstructure from the one end while constraining it from the other side, and we have uh, taken certain assumption where we are considering bilinear material behavior. By bilinear material be behavior it means that there are two slopes, elastic part and then plastic part. There is no change in the slope during the plastic part. We have considered plane strain loading condition, and stress and strain has been calculated at the centroid of the linear strain triangle. Now, the elastic part is uh, very easy, very straightforward. One has to do nothing. Simply increase the load. There is a stiffness matrix. And we, by Gaussian elimination, we can get the displacement. And from the displacement, there is a constitutive relation. We can get the strain. And ultimately, we can get the stress. And from that stress, each, each time we are increasing the load and checking in the yielding criteria whether yielding is taking place or not. 
if it's not happening, then we keep on increasing the load until the yielding occurs. But there is a tricky part. The, when we are in the when we are in the elastic part, everything is linear. But in between the loading stage, it always happens that uh, plasticity has started, and systems start to behave very randomly. So in that case, say we are here at the A, we are supposed to go to C, but uh, we end up here. So it's a big problem. So for that, there is a technique called proportional reduction. By simple calculation, we calculate a value of a constant r, which uh, make by which we are able to calculate what is the plastic strain at this stage when it is supposed to be at C, and what is the uh, uh, what 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 is the what is the stress at the yield point at in particular condition. This part, this is not C, this is a uh, stress at, at this point. So now we know the plastic strain. And after the calculation of plastic strain, we calculate stress by Euler forward subdivision. But it simply means that we divide this strain into small, small parts. And simply uh, by the constitu uh, constitutive uh, elastoplastic relation, we calculate the stress. It's simple, but there is a problem. Since it is an implicit technique, what happens, what, I, what we have observed, that this is a yield surface. During the loading, yield surface has expanded. And the moment it has expanded, the, the stress should be at the yield surface, but it goes away. It always happens. So we have, we, have, we have devised a technique by which we have corrected this phenomena called yield surface drift. And this has to be done again and again and again during the iterations. So we have, we have carried out some uh, calculation. Uh, we, we, we started with initial microstructure, we meshed it, and after that we have calculated a bit of uh, von Mises stress distribution and elastro, uh, equivalent plast uh, plastic strain distribution by our code. Uh, in the later part of our uh, presentation, we have compared that, but somehow it's not here. Uh, so thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you, Gautam. Um, any question? Can I have water? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. Thanks for a very interesting lecture. Thank you, sir. But I wonder if, because you are considering a plastic strain on the on the grain level, isn't it necessary to consider uh, crystal plasticity models rather no, no, than no, a, a von Mises yield no, surface? We are not considering plastic strain at the grain level, but the grain is discretized into uh, this linear strain triangle. There are thousands of linear strain triangle in each grain, and for each grain there are many node points. So. Uh, yes, it's but it means that you are working on the local crist crystal level. Then you 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 have because you 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 cannot average anymore your your um, continuum plastic behavior in a in a von Mises type yield locus. You are absolutely right. I am doing the similar work for uh, bimodal distribution, and in this case, solution is converging. But in bimodality, it's not converging. The possible explanation could be what you are giving, but Crystal plasticity is a bit uh, complex for me at this moment. Uh, okay. Thank you. We can discuss further this. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Um. Yeah, it's nice to see that somebody started to use uh, some kind of uh, RFE or CE simulation package to, to do something. Uh, you showed that, uh, I think it's called uh, VMS for the residual stress, I suppose. Residual stress, no, it's a plastic stress develop, being developed during the straining. Okay. We are right. loading it and the strain developed. Uh -huh. uh, I understand so, a, a key part for this kind of uh, analysis is how you calculate your strain. Yes, that absolutely is, right. What absolutely. are the contributions that you considered in your strain calculation? Actually, uh, the way I uh, move forward, when I'm going into the elastic part, it's linear. But the moment I went into the plastic part, uh, there, are, there, are, there, are, uh, there is elastic 
and uh, yeah, I, yeah I, I saw that part it. yeah uh, when the elastoplastic transition take place i use this uh, constant r to to have that okay this is this is this is the plastic uh, strain but the moment i moved into the plastic part in the iteration part when the at a particular node when it has moved into the plastic region i considered that uh, the all all the uh, deformation occurring is a is a plastic it's a big assumption but yeah uh, but, I, I did uh, do you point. think you need to consider other contributions like uh, thermal strain transmission uh, uh, transmission induced plasticity those kind of thing yeah that's what yeah I, you are uh, absolutely uh, right actually uh, that's the bad thing about ensis ensis is a very easy anyone can do that but but ensis cannot include this transformation strain it is my aim ultimately to include this uh, when in deep steel uh, uh, multisetic transformation occurs what and those contribution would of strain would substantially vary the result you are absolutely right thank you uh, yeah. thank you <laughs> yeah is this a two dimensional or a three dimensional uh, sir i'm still struggling with a two dimension problem three dimension is very complex two quick questions yes, sir. Um, one has to do with the objective function yes, that sir. you are minimizing or maximizing. Yes, sir. And second part is uh, micro and macro. Yes, sir. Are there contributions of surface energy somehow that is ignored in this formulation? Surface because, um, you know, if you are talking about plasticity, the size and shape are changing, and so are the surface energies. So is it important or is it not important? I would ask, answer one by one. Your first question was? <laughs> In GA, you define an objective function, yeah. right? Now, mm -hmm. objective function could be based on strain or based on stress. What I exactly are you using? Because actually, actually, uh, you, if you see, uh, in this case, we, are, we have done some post-processing. And uh, I call those hot spots. Hot spots of strain and hotspot of stress. I want to minimize both by using genetic algorithm objective function, where in the objective function, there would be finite elastoplastic finite element program and to minimize that. And second question, sir? Uh, maybe you can con discuss con later. Con contribution of no, no, sir, I have, we, because can, because we yeah. can discuss later. Yeah, sure. Um, despite the um, limitation of this model, um, yeah. What is your uh, best morphology in terms of uh, DP steel? What is the best uh, yeah. volume fraction of morphology? It's a big question, but yeah, yeah but uh, uh, in I'm, terms I'm, of strength and elongation. I right? love to talk intuitively, but uh, mm. but still, uh, I have done some more calculation on the different structure. Something in between banded and engulfed structure, something like corrugated structure. Yeah. you would get the best property in that. Okay, that that means you can actually help. Uh, say Tata steel in terms of processing, try to get the best microstructure morphology in, in terms of No, uh, it's a still a long way to go because okay. I'm telling you can make this, yeah. you can make I, I that. I know it's still a long way to go, but yeah. yeah, it's a feedback, isn't it? Yeah, you can say that. I guess. Um, any more question? I think. I, I really like the way you started off with the Roman arch and going forward with that. So in all these things in the external loading conditions becomes very, very important, correct? Yes, sir. So how are you going to design, let's say Tata Steel is going to make a chassis for a car. Mm -hmm. And how would you think about it, envision, not about math point, but from the concept point of it, what would you think the arrangement of structure should be? So uh, like in this case, it's a simple uniaxial tension, tensile condition. But uh, say I gain expertise with this uniaxial tension, I know how uh, these stresses are behaving. And I don't know whether it's possible or not, but say I'm capable of, uh, sorry, what happened? It's OK, you don't yeah. need a picture, you can uh, talk. Okay. Uh, sorry, in this case, uh, if, if I'm capable of, of, of understanding those tensor sort of thing, which I do not understand at this moment, that how the external stress influence the local stress. It's just evolving. I don't know how that is involving, evolving. So if I'm capable of understanding that, then I may be able to answer the question. So I may suggest there is a one of the theory Professor Ashby has been pushing forward. It's called hybrid materials. Yeah, I've read the paper. So I've it would be nice to reflect on that to see microstructures can be tweaked. Yes, sir. Yes. 
Thank you. Um, I guess we thank you, uh, speaker. Uh, My pleasure.